Thank you all for joining us tonight. Welcome to our sixth edition of Free Game. We're so excited to have you. Before we get started with the intros, I want to take a moment and give a shout out to those who are in our boutique spaces joining us tonight. Thank you for coming in space and being with us. We appreciate you. Um, we're going to make sure you have a good time uh, as you join us tonight. My name is Chantel Mack, Team Whitaker Group. Super excited to be here with you all. You could have chosen to be anywhere else, but you chose to be with us, so thank you. I'm gonna kick it to James to do our next intros. What's good, everybody? Uh, James Whitner, owner and founder of the Whitaker Group. Um, I'm excited uh, for a couple of things. Uh, this, this, this series has been incredible. And um, tonight's, a, tonight's a hell of a night because we get a chance to bring uh, probably two of the most experienced uh, fellas that's disgraced us on, on this panel so far. Uh, Craig Williams and Scott Uzel. I'm not going. I'm not going to steal their thunder. I'm going to uh, let them introduce themselves, and then we're going to dig in. But I think once we uh, once we get into it, you guys will start to understand uh, why, why why tonight's going to be so special. Uh, Craig, you want to go first? Scott, you want to go first? Uh, yeah, I got I got to hand the stage to G Scott because um, if I go first, I'm gonna hear about it for the next month. Go ahead, brother. I was going <laughs> to yield to you, my man, but anyway, I'll take it. Hello, everyone. I'm Scott Azell. I, uh, I lead the Converse business um, within Nike, Inc. Um, been with Nike for two and a half, almost three years. Before that, I spent um, 15 years at the Coca-Cola company. Before that, I worked at Procter & Gamble and Kraft Nabisco. Basically, spent my time, my whole career in sales and marketing and operations. But um, the best thing I've ever done in my life has been in a sneaker business and having a ball. Scott, I Scott, my, I, Scott, yeah. Scott, I, Scott, I need you to come back on one thing, man. You that was okay. an amazing intro. You said you lead the sneaker business, man. I'm not what what does lead mean? What's I, I need I need to hear your I need right. to hear, okay. what, what is your uh, title? I'm, I'm the CEO of Converse, of Converse sneakers. Yeah. There you go. That's what I need to hear. <laughs> thank he, thank he you, good real, brother. I, I appreciate he, you. He real, bro. I, 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 I appreciate you. I appreciate that's 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 the CEO of Converse. Uh, Scott, thank you, man. We appreciate you making the time tonight, bro. No problem. I'll dish you to Craig. All right. What's up, y'all? Uh, I'm Craig Williams, uh, AKA Gloria's husband. Uh, that's what I go by. That's my title, James, before you start asking me all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, that's what I go by <laughs> or Kelsey's daddy or Keisha's daddy. That's what I go by. Uh, a couple of folks know me as uh, the Jordan brand president, uh, but those other titles uh, are the most important to me. Um, I've spent the uh, last three years on the Jordan brand um, and before that, a number of years at uh, Coca-Cola where I met the esteemed G. Scott Uzel. Um, I, I spent uh, uh, a few years also at uh, Kraft Foods and in the U.S. Navy. I didn't have the distinction of being able to go to FAMU. I just went to Benedict College in humble Columbia, South Carolina, where I met my wife 30 years ago and we still hanging to this day. So forget y'all. That's all I gotta say. Yo, yo, I I I love I love how y'all throw these uh these these 30 years out there. You ain't got no grades in your beard, but we're gonna talk about that later, man. We're gonna talk about that later. There you go. Yo. Yo, so we we gonna get we gonna just dig straight into it. Chantel, did I did I did I miss anything before we dig? Because I'm, I'm I'm gonna start digging quick today. Nope. Other than the fact that this is just steps to business expansion, so get ready with your questions. All right. So so we talking about steps to business expansion, but first first we gonna go into some human questions, right? And cause cause there was a reason I wanted to uh bring bring notice to the titles for uh, both of these fellas because you don't you don't you don't become the president or CEO of a company. Without without really understanding how to how to how to handle pressure, and how to operate big organizations consistently over a long period of time, and um, I've had the pleasure of uh, of speaking spending time with both of you guys and understanding who you are. So so talk to me talk to me and talk to us a little bit about uh, how do y'all consistently come in big pressure games? Every every day is the championship when y'all show up, and it's been that way for a very long time especially in a run up to get where you are now and 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 over the last 15 years of your life like obviously you don't get to these seats where you're able to um show up as you are every day without going through some things so talk to me about what it's like to handle that pressure but not just handling that pressure handling that pressure as a black man in corporate america 
Jay, you want me to start? Scott. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Craig. I'll follow you lead. The next right. one, I'll go first. We'll go back and forth. All right, cool. So, um, uh, you know, being a black man in corporate America just is, right? Born black, raised black, uh, more die black. So I can't change that one. You know, the best thing that we can do is, uh, you know, step up to the plate and hit home runs, try to hit home runs every time. So, you know, um, black is what black is, but I'm proud of that. When I talked about being Gloria's husband and Kelsey's dad and Keisha's dad, those are the things I think about on a daily basis. And so if you want to tap into the source of your superpower, you first have to know who you represent in James. Um, and so when I think about my family or I think about my faith or I think about, you know, my mama and my daddy, just like everybody else, and we want to do good by the names that they gave us, we want to represent the last names, you know, that, you know, we were born into, represent the cities, represent the communities, you know, that we all come from. It requires two things. One, it requires being able to lean on the practice in order to be able to play in the big game moments. And so all of us practice, you know, our skill sets. It doesn't matter if, you know, James is you or anybody else. You know, we have numbers that we need to know. We have leadership capabilities that we need to, you know, sharpen on a, a, on a daily basis. And you can't just roll out the bed and expect to be great. You have to have put in the work in order to be great on a consistent basis. And when you do that, you don't have to overthink then being great when the moment gets big. Uh, because you do what you practiced uh, in those moments, and it always works out. Um, the second thing that I do, though, in addition to, you know, practicing and making sure that I'm on my game when I step into those rooms, uh, I also simplify the situations because each of those people in there have, you know, families that they're representing, too. Each of those people are proud to be, you know, in those moments, and they do the best of their, possible, uh, the best of their ability, um, but their families are no more important than mine. Uh, and their families, you know, don't, des their families deserve their excellence, but my, my family deserves more. And so when I think about it, the simplest way that I can identify with somebody else is that we're all there to do great things together. And I don't want to shrink in the moment. If they're going to be great, I'm going to be greater. If they want to be, you know, leaning on their superpower, I kind of want to tap into mine too. And in that way, I think that we can all be like beautifully human, but at the same time, be superhuman by being able to work together. I don't shrink from those moments. I actually get excited about those moments. And I think that's something that we can all implement. It doesn't matter, you know, where our place of business is. James knows I used to be an engineer before, you know, I worked in business uh, and the same thing exists there. If I'm going into a plant every day, I'm trying to do the same thing. I'm trying to be the best plant guy that I can be. Uh, and I don't, you know, shrink from, you know, those opportunities. So that's kind of how I think about it. Uh, I practice to be great. And so my expectation is I don't have to think about it in the moment. And at the same time, you know, the simplest, you know, motivation, you know, making Kelsey smile when she sees her dad do something or, you know, deserving my wife's hug uh, when I go home every day. Those are things I think about. Now. Well said, bro. Scott, uh, I, I, I mean, I'll jump in if it's okay, James. I mean, first please, of all, please. love everything Craig said. You know, one thing I love what Craig said is that um, someone asked me, like, what's it like to be in your job as a black man? And I just said, well, I've never been nothing but a black man. So it's like asking a fish, what's it like to be wet? You know, if you've been wet your whole life, I don't know what it's like to be on land. So that's kind of first. But then I'd say this, the evolution of me as a black man has happened over the last seven or eight years where up until about seven, eight years ago, I thought I had to be perfect every day. I mean, I had these tapes in my head that my mom, my dad, my grandparents, you got to get up earlier and jump higher and run faster and be smarter and, you know, all this stuff. And I mean, they were, I mean, I'm not saying they're wrong. You got to work twice as hard and all this stuff that when things weren't going well for me in life, I always thought I just have to work, get up earlier, work later. And what I learned in the last five to seven years is that sometimes you just got to be smarter. You got to step back and actually edit and do less and focus more and still go to bed at 7, 30, 8 o'clock. And I, I did, I tell you, nobody really taught me that. And, and actually, you're more productive that way than thinking you can always double work your way out of everything. And, if, and when I come to that, James, is that I got to a point where the jobs and the work wasn't about me just working harder 
I had to work differently. And then sometimes the problems were just bigger than me. Like there was just, I mean, I mean, I hate to say it, it's just, it's sometimes it was just like, there was nothing I could do, but you know, and I could work harder and kill myself. It still be the same problem. So, you know, and so for me, I'm at a point where I'm smarter that I can start to look at things and saying, okay, this, if I do actually work harder, I can get myself through it. But this one, I need to just be smarter and do fewer things and have an impact or this, it ain't fixable. Like it's just broke and, it, and this thing's going down. And so, and ride, you're going to ride it out. And um, I never really thought about things like that because the reason that was important for me is that I always felt like failure is not an option, right? So it's like, I got to make sure that it's perfect no matter what. And that burden on my shoulder, thank God I figured out that I can't be perfect every day. I already knew it, but it just admitting it to myself that I just can't be perfect. And then I tell you this, I sleep better. I walk, I walk with more confidence. I just, um, you know, because, you know, and all I say is the people that don't look like us, they don't walk around with that burden every day. And so, you know, I had a mentor say to me, like using a sports metaphor, that um, the guy who knows he should be on the team because his dad was on the team, his mother's on the team, like when the game's not in jeopardy, they're not diving for the ball. They're not, they don't care if the crowd says, oh man, he's not in it. He's like this, I'm not going to injure myself to show y'all I'm supposed to be here. You get me who I'm just happy to be here. And I'm like, my parents told me I got to work hard. I'm diving for every ball. And then the next game I'm coming in with skin, knees, ankles hurt, everything else, and still trying to perform. And I just said, that ain't smart. So anyway, long winded story to say that I'm, I'm just trying to be smarter and trying not to let those tapes that, um, that my wonderful parents and grandparents told me not to, you know, kind of put me under. Well, and, and, and I think what I took from both of y'all, what, what Craig, I love what you said was, and, and I'm making sure that I go back and forth with you, uh, both Scott and Craig, because Scott, I just took that you got to work smarter, not harder, right? And then Craig, what it is you said is you got to focus and you got to, you got to represent yourself, represent who you are, right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing the relationship with yourself. And that's something we've talked about a lot. And I'm hearing that, that, in in Scott, over the last seven years, um, you've you've said you've you've learned smarter, not harder. So let's go backwards the other way. And we're talking about expanding your business, but before you can expand your business, you got to expand who you are and your belief. Like something that I personally believe is, you can't get something until you want something, right? And if you don't know what to want, and if you don't have if you don't have to allow yourself to dream big, think big, and to believe that you have the ability to get to a space you'll never just stumble on it, right? Intentionality intentionality takes you where you want to go. So talk to me about at the point where you realized that you wanted something that was much bigger than what was around, than what was around you, right? Because I don't think either of you grew up around uh, Black CEOs and Black presidents, right? So at, at what point did y'all re realize like, oh, shit, this is what I want. I have the ability in and, and when did you discover your superpower that you knew was going to help get you there? I'll, I'll go for it, Craig, and I'll flip to Craig. My story, the reason the last five to seven years, I worked in the venture capital space where I basically um, went to, um, to the Coca-Cola company and banks and said, hey, can I get 20, 30, 40, 100 million dollars to go invest in this business? And what I figured out about the whole, my story about being perfect is in that business, nine out of 10 things fail. And, the, and the, the men and women that make like lots of money, do all this great stuff, they get the one big one that's successful. Well, if you take the tape that I had as a guy of color, that's trying to be perfect because I know if I'm not perfect, I won't be shot before the, everybody, right? That's what my dad taught me, right? So, and then I'm going into a space that no matter what I do, if I'm really good, I'm still going to miss three out of four pitches. And that's pretty good. But my dad's told me I got to hit everything. So I had to get, and, and so therefore, no matter how hard I work, I was still going to have some failures. And so for me, I got really comfortable with, you know, that it ain't always going to work out, but I still got to have aspiration. I still got to play to win. I still got to figure out how to be successful, but to be comfortable that every time I swing that bat, I'm not going to hit a home run and, and stand tall 
and look everybody in the face and get back up. So for me, it was a combination of all that. And then, you know, watching the people in that space, because when you're in that space, they're not, I mean, I would go months or years about seeing people look like me in that room. They just learn to have the swagger of, you know what, I'm gonna get one out of 10 and it's just gonna kill it, you know, but um, and I'm comfortable with the nine bodies on the way that don't get me there. Well said, my brother, Craig. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I didn't see black CEOs growing up. Actually, I didn't even know what a CEO was. <laughs> Me either, yeah. <laughs> Real talk. I mean, it's just like I, I, I never knew any of that stuff. Um, but I figured out, you know, very early on that, you know, the secret to my ability or even interest in dreaming big, you know, came down to two things. Uh, one, it was a little bit of exposure, just a little bit to something that was beyond my meager circumstances was possible. All I knew, I grew up in inner city St. Louis. All I knew were, you know, gamblers, you know, drug dealers, you know, um, the, the whole nine. I mean, I don't have to paint that picture. Most of y'all know what that picture is. Uh, I got an opportunity to go and participate in a program called Inroads. Um, and I went to a college campus and took, you know, a class first time. And I was like, man, I didn't even know that was like possible. My whole, my whole definition of success was, you know, getting out of high school and probably joining the army or something like that. Um, but it gave me an opportunity to kind of unlock a, a picture of success that was just different than my daily surroundings. Uh, and that gave me permission to dream because up to then, I didn't know what to dream about. And that's the key for, you know, some of our kids, some of the people you know, in the community, when they see people like us walking back, and I say people like us, it doesn't matter what your title is to, to them, senior manager, you know, manage, ma manager of, you know, a restaurant or a, a store, uh, it doesn't matter. All of that looks like, wow, to most of the people in the communities where we grew up. Uh, and that's the key. If we can give them just a little bit of spark or encouragement that something beyond their circumstances is possible, then they could do the what if dreaming all on their own. The second thing um, that I had, uh, you know, which is a fight or flight mentality, uh, is a little bit of fight in me because somebody told me when I was little that I wasn't going mount to nothing. Now, when you, get, yeah, it, when you get that comment, you ain't going to never amount to nothing. You got two choices. You can embrace it and believe it uh, and just kind of go on and say, you know what, you're right. You know, that's kind of, that defines the box that I'm going to live in. Or you can go, you know what? I can't wait to prove you wrong. I can't wait to like show you something in your face that's going to take and make you eat those words. And to me, it was a second response. And so, you know, for me, that person that, you know, told me that my first 10 years uh, going into college and getting after college was to prove that person wrong. And I couldn't think of anything other than that. And it took me a while from a maturity perspective to kind of move into a place where my ambition was more constructive and more positive. It was more about getting to a place because I wanted it, getting to a place of growth because I aspired for it and it was gonna be something good for me and my family versus a middle finger to this cat that had the nerve to tell me something that I never embraced. But that was the transition. And I had a good person a long time ago who said, you, you're going to need a little fuel sometimes. And that's fine. And it's also OK to recognize that your fuel might be negative, you know, early on. We don't always have a picture of success in mind, but we know darn well what we don't want. And some of the pictures of what we don't want, everybody is seen on an everyday basis. And so sometimes you can figure out what constructive and what a better way looks like just by saying clear no's to the things that we know that we don't want because we've seen enough of those examples and we want to be a difference, frankly, uh, for our families and hopefully for some people that we encounter along the way. No, I think it's interesting that you mentioned inroads and the idea of um, seeing people in a way that you didn't see them because I took an inroads job. <clears throat> it's the only job I ever worked in my life. Um, and I used to have to come back to the hood in a suit and it was a very different way for people to have to for people to have to see me. And I and I, I vaguely remember my younger brother saying to me, like, yo, bro, is you gonna be able to help me get one of them suit jobs? 
right? And it, like it always is something that always stuck with right. me that yep. just just the visualization of someone wearing a suit where yep. we from means that they're that they're important or more important than the people that surround us. And um, I think it's interesting as we as we talked and something else that I wrote down was was the chip on your shoulder because I think that that's something else that we talk about. Um, that chip and the motivation and, and, and getting through the hurdle. But as we start to talk about expanding our business, and I, and I think I think a lot of it always goes back to us personally, just talk to me about some of those moments where, where you needed to expand your brand, to expand your business. And Chantel, if there's anything specific that, that I need to hit in, in the chat around that, that people have interest in around, around specific topics around expand, expand the business, keep me honest so I can make sure I manage our time. Uh, but I'm, 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 I'm probing and listening. I'm, I'm, I'm learning here too, but, but fellas, please, please take me on a bit of a journey and, and talk, talk to me some about how you had to get through. Cause, cause uh, Craig and Scott, you are both, you're both talking about it, but Scott, you mentioned your last job was uh, getting a hundred million from like, yo, that's a big ass number, right? Let's click down a few levels. Cause a lot of these kids are just, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're just, they're just going. And there was a point that you were at, I'm sure, um, where you were, both of you had to really, really figure out how to get in the game or you were down in the game, right? A, a spot where y'all, where y'all both was like, man, I don't got enough. I can't get here. I can't make it. This ain't going, this ain't going to work for me, man. I'm gonna have to go do something else. Talk to us about some of that. Yeah. I, I say this Scott, on the one piece on, yeah, from a, in my alphabet, sure. yeah, on business standpoint, I'd say this, getting real, like I, I think about the hundreds of business plans that I looked at and, you know, and, and people were coming in to try to raise money or look for investment or even today when I sit on situations where, where I'm looking at business opportunities. And what people underestimate is the, the focus on the consumer. And meaning that you can have a great business idea that on paper can make a lot of money and the spreadsheet works and you know blah 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 but what's really key is being able to get the insights from the consumer you're going at like whether what are you trying to solve like are you creating are you solving a problem are you creating an emotional connection and it can be anything from you know from a lawn cutting business to a car wash to opening a store to building a shoe um, putting the consumer as boss and I meet a lot of business people um, and with various levels of experience that underestimate that. I, I won't give the name, but I literally a couple of weeks ago met with um, um, a, a privately owned um, person owns a bunch of um, Anheuser-Busch distributors. Like, um, you know, so they have lots of money, but they, they own like, you know, parts of a state for beer and they want to get into buying snack and food companies. So at dinner, they were talking to me about, you know, this brand looks amazing. Do should I invest? And every time when they put one in front of me, I kept saying, what's the unique consumer hook? And they're like, well, we can do supply chain. We can deliver it. You know, we know how to get to the retail store, but I'm like, that's great. But if it's piece of, if it's not very good to get it everywhere, isn't a right to win. But if it's something really good, then let's talk about getting it everywhere. But my only point is a lot of people miss that, that fundamental piece of, what are you trying to solve for the consumer? Because that's what builds businesses. That's what I believe biz builds businesses. It's not just about, I can make it, I can move it, I can get it everywhere, but it's really around what's unique about it and why is it gonna create like a passionate connection to the consumer? And Scott, so for, 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 for transparency, you're, you're talking about, I understand, you're talking about from your experience working in a private equity space, right? Yep. Can you give can you give a little more context so people understand what that is at a very at a very very low level so so people who who are just starting businesses really understand what that is and and how it functions as a part of business. Yeah. So what I like to tell people is that um what do we talk about once the after they leave the room and they just made their pitch for you know whether it's five hundred thousand dollars or you know a hundred million couple hundred million dollars. And basically, we go through five or six things. One, we talk about what is the motivation for the entrepreneur? Like, are they trying to make money? Are they in this because they love it? 
Are they passionate about it? Have they had a unique experience of why they are in a unique position to really understand the needs? I give an example. They're making a basketball shoe and they used to play basketball. Or I think about a beverage company that I've invested in called um, Health Aid. It's a kombucha company. The woman made it because her mom had cancer and she was having chemo and she couldn't retain liquid. So she developed a beverage that um, rehydrated her mom after she got chemotherapy. So my point is, there was a passionate reason why they were in it and they had a unique position that it's just not a widget they're selling. Then second, after we get after the motivation for the entrepreneur, we want to understand what's the unique consumer proposition? Like, why would a consumer want it? Well, it makes them run faster, jump higher, hydrate, um, low calories. It's great for the environment, whatever it is. But let's get really clear on the consumer proposition. Sometimes people come in and say, this is just as good as what Nike or Coke or, you know, um, the number one brand out there does. And therefore, you should invest. And I always would leave like, that's not a great idea. It's just as good as it. That's not good enough. It should be better than or have a unique position against it. So what's the consumer hook? Then we would get into what's the story? Like, how are they connecting with the consumers? Do they have a unique way? Like some entrepreneurs are like, you know, I get, I, I have a one-to-one -one relationship with my, my consumers. So when they go in Whole Foods, they go in the beauty section. She's going to explain why if you put this on your skin, it moisturizes you. Or, you know, when you come into my environment, I'm going to have you put the basketball shoe on and actually play in a mini basketball court. Whatever it is, that's like, we want to hear what's a unique way the entrepreneur is going to connect with the consumer. Then I would talk about what's their go-to-market strategy. So um have they chosen a channel is it about I mean, the the less sophisticated people would say the reason i'm here to see you guys because coca-cola can get it everywhere well a bad idea going everywhere is just going to cost us all a lot of money but an entrepreneur that says you know what? i don't want to be everywhere i want to be in new york in yoga studios and health food stores because that's where my consumer is that's a really thoughtful go-to-market strategy that's really important and then lastly can we make money? Like if we scale this, is this an opportunity for us to make money? Is it a really good idea? But I want you to understand it's really important. That was the fifth point. So many entrepreneurs lead with, I've got an idea, Scott. I want your money because it's going to make me all this money. It's all theoretical. But the first four points are most important. Why are you in it? Who's the consumer? How are you going to connect with the consumer? And what's your go-to-market strategy? You do those four things well. The spreadsheet will work itself. Too many entrepreneurs lead with the spreadsheet and don't have not answered the first four questions. It's, it's interesting that you say that because because on my side, <laughs> probably the spreadsheet probably still still lags at the end, but that's something we can talk about on another day. <laughs> but well said, well said, Scott. Greg, you want to jump in? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I just first first comment, you know, Scott got so passionate, he started sounding like my uncle, you know, when, when he was yelling, I didn't know it was my turn. I just I thought I was supposed to stay quiet, man. So uh, Scott, I feel you on that. Um, just a couple of thoughts, uh, James, as we talk about expansion. Um, the, the first question I have is uh, that I think that we should all think about is, you know, why do we want to expand? And a lot of people kind of miss that question. Um, because a simple response to that is, well, I want to make more money. <laughs> so a lot of people think about expansion as, you know, the first way to make money. And my argument is, is that it's actually not the first way to make money. Most rich people that you talk to will tell you that the best way to make more money is keep more of the money that you're making already, which is an exercise in efficiency, an exercise in understanding the P&L, an exercise in you know, understanding, you know, where your incoming is and where your outgoing is. And frankly, if you reduce your outcome and you got the same income and it's the quickest way and the easiest way to make more money. And so I would start with that question because if, if you can get that one right and if you can focus on efficiency within the same square footage or within the same, you know, business, you know, plan business, you know, idea that you have, it's actually the easiest way to make money. But the second thing, so let's say you have all that figured out and say, you know what, I want to expand. That's great. 
Uh, but then the question is, do you actually have permission to expand? Everything that Scott talked about is right. It's like, what, what's, what's the core idea? What's the consumer hook? Is it even interesting? Do people want to buy that? Those are, those are the permissions to expand. Everybody can like open the door. You can come up with enough you know, down payment to go buy something and open something, and that's great. But if you don't have the permission, and I'm talking consumer permission, and the infrastructure or the framework to be able to actually support a business, then it actually won't work. And so my point to the, the permission piece is important because if you can identify then, excuse me, what the basic components are to what you want to expand, that's the third piece. Because again, my argument, um, getting a second door before you actually think about what you might be able to offer additionally in the first door um, is, a, is a rush to me. I think it's actually inefficient. Um, the best way is to maximize the throughput and the efficiency of what you already have before you take on you know, additional uh, debt or burden, right? And so just thinking about it logically, I think is important because I wouldn't add, automatically go to a expansion just in a traditional sense to say, give me one, two or three of these or four or five or six of these. And I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, probably the best example I can give you, all right? When I was in college, Benedict College in uh, Columbia, South Carolina, I was a senior in college and I was broke. Uh, some of us could identify with that. Wasn't we all? <laughs> <laughs> I was a senior in college and I was broke. It was homecoming weekend and we recognized that all of the restaurants surrounding the college used to close early. The only thing that was open were the pizza joints and they were a little further away. We were broke, so we also didn't have cars. We couldn't get there. So a friend of mine and I came up with an idea. It was, really, it was a bunch of people, it was crowded and all those other things. We said, you know what? People need to eat. I think that we can provide it and we can make some money in the process. So we went to Little Caesars. We bought a stack of pizzas. They were on sale, $5.99, large pizzas. We don't need a lot of ingredients for hungry people. We bought about 10 large pizzas and we came back and we sold them for a dollar a slice. And we sold them for a dollar a slice that entire night and we like racked up from our perspective because we're seniors and we're broke. And right? you buy for a dollar, you sell for two. That's good business. Everyone is doing business. It's good business all day long. We had a boom box, you know, on the steps of the library. We playing hip hop music, everybody coming by. We made up a little slogan, come get your pizza, $1 a slice. It was all kind of stuff. I mean, we had a whole hook to this stuff, right? But the key is we took a step back and we said, you know what, what are we good at? We're good at identifying a problem. That's the people hungry. They need to eat. They're having a good time and they need to eat. We figured out that we can get some stuff on a supply basis that was pretty cheap and we could sell it for you know more than we were getting it. So that was pretty good. And then we're actually able to get to a marketplace strategy that Scott talked about because we set up in front of the library. Everybody had to come by. And you took advantage of an opportunity that was right in front of your face. No doubt about it. And so here's the next thing we did. We flipped that idea. And then we actually went inside the gymnasium and we sold concessions that actually weren't set up from an infrastructure perspective with the college. We sold popcorn, we sold candy, we sold all of this stuff. College was like, we can't give you any money. It was like, we don't need any money. All we need is a space. We'll go and buy the stuff. We know that the people are hungry and we'd have ran the economics to figure out that we can make money on this thing. So my point is, and it's a really simple point. It's like, what are you trying to expand? Figure out the core tenets of what you're offering and make sure that you can consistently replicate that when you think about whatever expansion looks like. McDonald's does this every day. If you go get a Big Mac in North Carolina or a Big Mac in Minnesota, they all taste the same. Your experience, regardless of whether you consider that experience good or bad, <laughs> it's, it's pretty doggone consistent. And it's interesting because they make burgers the exact same way. Their operational procedure is exactly the same because they figured out what the consumer experience that they want and that they want to replicate on a consistent basis that ladders up to the brand attributes that they are most important to them, they make them exactly the same. And they have an operation manual this thick to make sure that when they're replicating those jokers for franchisees that look, or franchisees, business owners, 
that look different in every market across the country and around the world. They can pick up that manual. They understand what's important to the McDonald's experience and they can replicate them all day long. So it doesn't matter if we have small businesses. The key is, what do we want to replicate that we know works? And how do we make sure that that experience operationally and everything else is consistent first time, second time, third time? But my, my encouragement, again, is that I wouldn't think about a new door before I think about maximizing the footprint within the existing door. And I wouldn't think about maximizing the footprint in the existing door until I made sure that the money that I was paying out can be as optimized and as efficient as possible because that's the easiest way to make more money. That's a, I'm, I'm gonna unpack that. And what I think I heard you say is make sure, make sure you're operating in the most, in, in the most efficient way possible in a space where you are. So the growth pulls you and you're not looking for it. That's exactly right. Yeah, it's, 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 interesting, it's, it's interesting as we talk about growth. Um, it's something that uh, I talked to, used to talk to Rigo a lot about. Um, you usually know uh, when, when it's time to grow because the, the markets pull you there. Sometimes you don't, you, you don't have to go. Uh, you, when, you, when you do what you do and you're connected to your culture and your community in a meaningful way, it starts to, they start to pull for you. Uh, something that we didn't get into, um, and I, and I want to get into some questions for a second, for a second, but I want to get to two things before we get into questions. Um, biggest, like biggest, biggest jump you've seen in expansion in your career, like someone who you've seen come in, 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 in any, in any of the places you worked, or it, it could have been a, it could have been a division you worked in a product you worked on or people you worked around, something that you've seen like, okay, this is gonna be good and it went on to be good and something that you thought was gonna be good and just went bust and why in both cases? Can we go first? Scott, you may have actually more examples of this. All right. Well, I'll give, yeah, I have two, two examples, the bust and the, 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 the first one's a winner. Um, we, I, I was part of investment team at invest in a brand called Body Armor that Kobe Bryant and a guy named Mike Rapoli started about five or six years ago. And the idea that you could develop a sports hydration beverage that was all natural, 80% coconut water with all kinds of cool stuff in it and very low sugar relative to Gatorade. And, um, and if, you, if you get the right athletes drinking it and you've got the right marketing plan with the right distribution approach and you get it priced at about 20% higher than the competition, you might be able to change the world. And, um, and that turned out to be like an $8 billion acquisition about two weeks ago, um, but for the, from the founder um, to the Coca-Cola company. And so that was a winner. The biggest failure that I, I, I had, that I had, I had a lot of failures, but one I think about, I made an investment in a brand called Suja and it's like, a, a, it's Suja was, it's, it's still out there. It's actually a juice beverage. So if you go to Whole Foods or Publix or whatever your local store is, they sell like, it's basically like opposed to going to a juice bar where you spend 12 bucks to get like beets and greens and kale and, you know, all kinds of stuff put in a bottle. Like they make it fresh. And within 48 hours, it goes from being in the ground to being a bottle. But then they have a process that, um, that keeps it like um, from without adding pasteurization that keeps it like still fresh so that you, when you get it, it's almost like you went to a juice bar, but you pay $5 for it. When we made the investment, I thought it was a slam dunk. We all thought it was a slam dunk. But four, five years ago, it was a big idea. Two years later, juice became bad, like too much sugar in juice, too much sugar in fruit. And basically, it went from a category growing 40% per year to not growing at all. And frankly, um, they had to write the business off. So, um, And all, all I learned from that is that the marketplace can change. Competition will always go where they think the next slam dunk is, and you know, no business is a gift. I mean, the, the future is not given to you and it can change overnight. And so for me, it, it just, um, it just I just think about how confident I was at the moment of this is a sure thing. It's like, you know, give me more money, I'll make us more money too. It was a bust two years later and now I never saw it coming to like a body armor. I never thought it'd be as big as it was. Wow, it's crazy to think, uh, what body armor we all just seen that one and the other one 
I was just listening and thinking about even how could something how could something be a bust, but I, uh, something be a bust that still exists that way. And some others may be thinking, like if it's in Whole Foods, is it still a bust? But I guess it's a bust relative to the investment. Yeah, and I'll tell you this: what's funny about the one that was a bust when we were investing in it, the founder was on the cover of Fast Company and Ad Age. His billboard was in Times Square. He had just bought a twelve million dollar house and and was on his way to buy a jet. I mean, he was like, "I'm there." Like it. This is just a matter of 24 months, I'm going to get my other 50 million bucks to 24 months later when I go tell him, dude, not only are we not investing, we're trying to get our money back. And this 50 year old man at Houston airport, when I met him on July 4th, two years ago, is crying in my lap because he knows when he goes home to tell his wife, they got to sell their house and the kids are coming out of college and he's selling all of his assets from where he was two years ago. And there's nothing I can do. Like, we're not going to buy a company that is, has no more promise. And I was like, wow, I told my wife, this is a tricky game, man. There's no guarantees out here. Yo. Yeah, that, that one, I, I, I got a couple more follow-ups on that, but I, I'll get you on a side on those ones. That, 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 there's a lot in that. Uh, Craig, yeah. go for it. I want to make sure I leave some space to get everybody's questions in. Yeah, I got a simple one. And, you know, frankly, it's one that I think that we can all identify. I, I kind of watched it from, um, you know, the sidelines, but it's really interesting. Um, so by show of hands, how many people on this call ever rented anything from Redbox? Redbox. Remember Redbox? Yeah, that's the DVD place, right? That's the DVD <laughs> place. That's the DVD place. Oh, you I almost have to you almost have to think about it that way. That that's the DVD place. But yeah, at one I'm point, my grocery store. Yeah, at one point, it was the biggest disruptor, yeah, the blockbuster, right. you know, that was out there. Uh, it was the thing that you know actually had forward deployed distribution. It was all about distribution, getting to the grocery stores, the Walgreens, and you know, literally being uh, uh, arms, you know, length away from desire. Uh, Scott will remember, <laughs> uh, you know, that idea. And what was interesting, and my wife and I just had this conversation literally in the past 24 hours. People also forget that Netflix started as a DVD company. People, people used to actually get mailed uh, DVDs from Netflix. Really? They would get them, watch them, and return them back to Netflix. And I see so you got people in the chat. I remember that. I remember that. That's how Netflix actually started. So you had two companies that were essentially in the same industry. Uh, and it's fascinating the decisions that one company made and the decisions actually that the other company uh, didn't make. Because the one company, Netflix, figured out real quickly, wait a minute, hold up. This game used to be about control and distribution. But the game quickly uh, migrated from controlling distribution to actually managing revenue based on content generation. You had to keep eyeballs engaged. And the other company just stayed completely focused on managing distribution. They wanted to be on every corner and in every grocery store. And they focused on physical assets that were associated with the distribution and the companies that made those assets, those DVDs. And it's fascinating because the industry can flip just like this and consumer demand can flip just like this. Direct TV is another example of someone that was focused again on distribution versus content development and content creation because distribution is ubiquitous. As soon as the internet and Wi-Fi became readily available, there were no more barriers. All the barriers came down to distribution. My whole point in that, you don't have to be, you know, uh, a media specialist to kind of understand this, but my whole point in this is what is strong and what, what delivers strength in an in industry or a business today, or what provides a moat around a business that you believe no one will be able to get across today can be immediately changed tomorrow if we're not careful. Now, that doesn't mean that our businesses crumble because Netflix is a prime example of someone that understood and recognized the indications of change and changed with it. And so it's a perfect example 
of being able to actually change based on conditions changing. And, and because conditions change doesn't mean that our initial business idea or our fate as business owners crumbles overnight. And so I love that example because most people don't remember that about Netflix. All you remember is the Netflix today, but I promise you, if you go look up, even on the internet, some old photos of Netflix business model, it wasn't that different from business models that have died many times over because they never changed. No, I, I definitely, I never, the idea that Netflix mailed movies at that, that, I must have missed that somehow. I, I, don't, I don't know, I don't know where I was at. I was under a rock. But I, I know we got we got uh, we got about nine minutes till eight. Uh, I want to make sure I'm respectful of everybody's time. So I want to get some questions in. Chantel, we just been going. Um, is, is there anything in the chat that we need to be thinking about right now? Absolutely. There are a lot of uh, questions on expansion. And there's uh, one of our audience members, uh, Tuck. I'll ask him to unmute. He had a question that I think will be good for him, but also for um, some of the, um, the business owners in the room. Um, I will ask as you ask your question so that we can honor time and get as many people as we possibly can in here. Y'all jump on here and ask the question that you put in the chat. Don't get us with the okie doke. We want to make sure we get as many people. So looking forward to hearing from you. Tuck, you want to unmute for me? Yep, I'm already going to come in quick because I know there's people behind me. Appreciate this conversation. Appreciate the free game as well through the whole entire series from part one to six. Appreciate you, James. Um, with business expansion, also your team has to expand as well. And then the responsibilities expand as well. So what are your qualities you're looking for when choosing your team? And then also, since you all are CEOs in your own business, how do you find your balance in your life when it comes to the brand, the family, and your faith? I like Craig. I'm going to let the public go. Um, okay, so qualities uh, that we look for in expansion of the team, I, I think some of those are consistent with the team. But what I would say is that is the following. If you can look for people with learning agility, uh, that'll make all the difference. Learning agility, uh, simply defined, uh, is a person that is curious enough to consistently add to himself or herself such that their capabilities and skill sets never get stale. And it's much more a mindset um, uh, versus like a, a, a skill set that you're buying. If you buy that mindset, you're going to be in terrific shape. The second thing, as far as expansion is concerned, is, you know, the attributes that made you successful in day one and the procedures and the infrastructure that you surrounded yourself with in day one are going to be completely different uh, when expansion comes. You know, so running, you know, big boy business or grown up businesses or two or three, you know, different, you know, uh, models, you're going to need infrastructures to actually support, you know, employee uh, conditions, uh, environmental and community conditions that are different when you only have one door. And so I would just think about, you know, infrastructure and core supply from a central location out. Think about that. And then think about, you know, people that, you know, can actually be different people, you know, by way of what they deliver to you. Uh, into their teammates um, tomorrow versus today. Scott, you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to say this. I did everything Craig said. One thing I've learned about um, picking talent in the last few years, if you talk to me five or six years ago, I was I want the best rebounder, the best dribbler, the best outside shooter. And if they had a bad attitude, I was cool with that. But I've learned that that is not as important as uh, it's having a person who's a de pretty good shooter but really wants to play as a part of a team because the person who this is, I'm not saying I'm right, but the pro problem is when you have, um, I'm dating myself, the Dennis Rodman on, on the team, they grab 23 rebounds a game, but you spend 25% of your time trying to figure out how to keep them happy. And that means you're not spending time with the team. And so I've really taken a new stance in the last couple of years. I spent, I will take longer to hire to find the right person who's going to play well with the team and maybe give up something on being just the best at. I'd rather have that than someone who's just a deadly shooter, but just high drama because I don't like drama. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, Tuck, what I loved about your question is we, we could actually do a whole, we could actually do a whole session on that question because th th there, there's, there's so much more to unpack. Because both of their answers, I want to go, I want to be dig dig deep into, but I got to be mindful of time. Um, but, but yo, the, the learning agility, and then you know, having someone who's a specialist versus 
someone who has a, a pretty good attitude. I got a bunch that I want to throw in there, but I won't. Chantel, uh, uh, let's let's get another one. Tuck, do we answer your questions effectively, yes. bro? Yes, sir. Appreciate y'all so very much. No, nah, bro. Pre appreciate you for always being a part. The next one we have coming up, uh, Channing, if you can answer the, ask the second part uh, to your question, it will kind of coincide with this question. Okay, I got you. Hi, guys. Um, so my question was essentially, um, as two gentlemen who are at the helm of large companies, how do you navigate championing our community and telling our stories authentically um, with the tendency of many large brands to prioritize agenda over community storytelling? She said gentlemen, so Scott, you got to go first. Okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you. You promoted me, I'll take it. You know, I'd say this, I, you know, I, I'm going to tell a quick story that's going to connect to it. One of the brands I invested in about six or seven years ago you know, was a brand called Honest Tea. And basically, the, the, it's based in D.C. And the founder um, is a person that's all about the environment. Like he's made tens of millions of dollars and he lives in the same house. He gets furniture that he sees on the side of the road and brings it in because he doesn't want to create new furniture. Um, I mean, he is the real deal. I mean, he walks if he can always ride his bike or walk doesn't want to impact the environment. And so, um, so when, when we made our investment, Big Bad Coca-Cola, the chairman of, um, of Whole Foods called and said, look, we're going to throw you guys out. You've sold out. And so I went and talked to him. I said, are you worried about this thing about selling out and everything else? And he said, look, he said, I don't want to be a nonprofit. The only reason people listen to me around the environment is because I make sure my business is connecting with consumers, it's growing, and it's relevant. So for me, Scott, they work hand in hand. I don't, I won't, I cannot change the world unless both are working. And then I kind of flip to the question of us. We've got to have businesses and brands that are relevant, that continue to connect with consumers, that, you know, that, that play their role. That gives us a stage or a platform for us to bring, um, A, the role model who we are, B, to make sure that the brand and all that it's about has an impact on our community and make sure that we're hiring and bringing people in that give people opportunities that didn't have it in the past. So I, I, it's a long winded story, but I think they both have to go hand in hand. I used to think of them as either or, but the either or I go back to my colleague's example of this company I invested in. He said, the minute I become a sustainability brand that people like taste it, they go, yeah, but good for the environment. I won't be here. So I've got to make sure that A, I'm connecting with everyone, but that gives me the platform to bring change that I want. So I, I don't know if that answers. I'll, I'll flip it to Craig or James. No, it definitely does answer because even on our side, we, we always talk about the balance of uh, sugar and veggies. If you serving people veggies all day, you, you're not going to keep their attention. You have to keep people's attention. We're talking about human beings. This is earth. Uh, right. So the first thing we got to understand about our consumers, they're actually consumers. And without dollars, we have no business. And without business, there is no interest. So we can't do work without work, if that makes sense. Love it. Uh, go, go for it. I, love that. Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, you guys, you guys are hitting on, you know, um, the exact same thing. I think, you know, Channing, one of the mistakes that we often make is that we look at our responsibility to the community. Uh, as an issue of fairness, an issue of what's right, uh, or an issue of what we should be doing based on goodwill and humanity. Um, businesses uh, think in uh, the language of dollars and cents. And that's not wrong. That's, that's, that's what businesses are here to do. They think in language of dollars and cents. So our responsibility is to be able to translate the needs of the community in the language that the business understands. It's as simple as that, but it's so important that if you forget it, you'll be like completely frustrated because everybody isn't paying attention to the most important thing in the world to you. And I'll give you just a, a, a simple example. At Coca-Cola, we learned um, a very simple phrase, and that is the health and welfare of the communities where we reside and do business is of interest to us because when they're healthy, we're healthy. 
when they buy, we benefit. And so all we do on an everyday basis is connect the health and welfare and benefit of the community to the primary objective of a business, and that is to grow top and bottom line. And so we should be interested to do this program, this initiative, and this help in the business, because when we do, the business's ability to be able to um, partner with our company and consume more is strengthened. That's a common sense thing. And the only thing that I've seen in my years, you know, in corporate America is when we come in and we like, you know, pound into the chest and we're talking about what's fair and what's right and all those other things, it's missing people left and right all day long. And it doesn't make it wrong. It, like what we're saying is not wrong. It's just like we're speaking Chinese to an English speaking company. And all we got to do is speak English. Ain't nothing wrong with that. And if we speak English and they get it, then the community wins and the company wins and we're great. And that's what Scott's talking about. We can't turn into a nonprofit overnight. And there's some companies out there that are smart enough and wise enough to understand automatically the humanity and the well-being aspect of being you know, good citizens with the community and all those other things. But 99.9% .9 of the rest of them jokers need us to translate and that's facts. Oh, well, well, well said by both of you fellas. Uh... I think it's I think it's interesting because I think you both know where I stand on a on a on a on, on a side of, of, of building a business that helps feedback. But I I'll just echo what you both said. Like you, you can't you can't do it unless you're aligned with your partners, and you can't you you can't make you can't make everyone care about the things you care about. You have to you have to have a meaningful business proposition, and you got to have empathy for others, right? And as a partner. It's not always about caring exactly about what they care about. It's just about having empathy for who they are as people and humans and, right. and, and, and going on a walk, going on, doing things with them um, when they're meaningful for them, right? Like, I think empathy is the biggest word in business, but to, I think you said it, Craig, you can't expect a business to understand that. The people in the business who run the business have to understand that and align to that. But, it, it, but always be mindful that it's a business. Uh, They'll get it if you translate it for them, for sure. One hundred percent. Chantel uh, and, and Scott, I, I want to take this second to, uh, to thank you, man. I, I know you got a, I know you got a hard stop. I, at got, eight. I got fifteen. I got fifteen. Oh well, 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 well fellas, uh, let's keep the party going then. Can I mean, no, I, I don't want to mess you up. I'm, I'm just saying. Oh, no, no, oh no, oh no, whoa, whoa, we can, we can, man. Listen, we can keep this party going. I don't think, uh, uh, Craig, is that okay with you? Yeah, man, but I got a pee, so y'all better. <laughs> I'm just saying, y'all got y'all got a few minutes. For real. Uh, all right, all right. These, so we we, we gonna get life issues. I'm doing man, man, man. Listen, if you start tap dancing over there, then we know what time it is, man. But, but <laughs> feel like if you feel like you need to run, run. Uh, yeah, uh, Chantel, let's yeah. let's uh, let's make the best use of this next eleven minutes. Let's do this. I really want to get one in from one of our audience members um, out in Charlotte. Thank you all for attending in Charlotte. Daryl had a question. And just going to the story part really quickly, he says, what are the key points a consumer looks for in your story as you're talking about expanding your brand or storytelling in your brand? And all three of you have done that so well. What do you think the key points a consumer looks for in your story? In story? I think it has to be a real story. Uh, th th that's the first thing. It, it has to be your story, right? And, 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 and so much is made up of of product and stories told the to product. But when humans are telling stories, I think it's very important that it, you, you use your authentic, you, you use your voice and, 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 and be your uh, authentic self. Uh, that's just my quick take on it. I, I don't want to take up too much space. Uh, Scott, Craig? I'll just- uh, I'm, I'm going to yield to Craig because I think you're, I think Jordan just does an amazing job on storytelling. Yeah, I, I think, um... You know, James, you hit it, but the, the, the key, you know, to me is um, uh, two elements. Uh, the first is it definitely has to be authentic. So it has to be real to you because the passion um, and the interest that you have in the story will be conveyed in the way that you tell it. If it's fake, people will know all day long. Um, but if it's meaningful and it's, if it's real to you, people will get that because you'll convey that with every word that you use. But the second thing is, is that it has to have an element of truth and commonality 
that people identify with, even if they were never in the exact experience. And so you, you hear great comedians talk about this all the time. All I do is tell the truth. And when I tell the truth from an angle and people understand, yeah, that's the truth, then they can find the humor in it because it's so relatable. Two minutes ago, I told y'all I had to pee. I guarantee you, every one of you have too felt that sensation before. <laughs> you ain't squirming yet, though. You holding it. <laughs> ah, bro, I'm, I'm struggling, though. I'm struggling big time. <laughs> but but it, even in telling that story, because you understand exactly the situation that I'm in right now, uh, you can identify with it. And that's all storytelling is. It's being able to convey the message in a way that's true and honest. I am squirming. But at the same time, because you have been in that situation and you understand it, then the power of the story is revealed that way. If you never understood it, or if you never even began to experience it just, just remotely, then it's a comment or a story that just goes right by your head. And it's the most interesting thing in the world, but just being true and honest, you know, in that moment when you're telling the story is the most important thing that we can all do. Somebody commented, Craig, that uh, MJ had to pee in the third quarter of a game, so you got to put out some P4s. <laughs> no, nah, we can't do no P4s, dog. <laughs> no, it, 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 it was Juan. Juan. <laughs> that, that was funny. <laughs> uh, hey, you know, I'm for, one, for one more question. Okay. This is the last one. You want? Yeah, I, I, you running the show. I'm sorry, boss. I'm sorry. <laughs> Walter, I, one of the things you want to make sure we hit is uh, recognizing tools for expansion. And Walter had a question overall when it comes to going outside for execution. So Walter, ask your question, sir. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my question for you guys is, um, A, is it difficult? And then B, when do you recognize that even though you may have the vision, the execution, you have to seek outside assistance with that? Ooh, that's a good one. I'll, I'll take a first stop at it. You know, um, I, a couple of weeks ago, um, a, 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 a black business, one of the largest black businesses in the United States, the leader asked me to go look at a business. He sent me something to go look at a business for my old job, even though I was, you know, in the evening. He sent me something to drink. He sent me a business plan and told me to Zoom with the founder. And when I got off the phone, with the, when I got off the Zoom with him, I talked to him. He said, what do you think? Should I put money in? And I said, look, she's really big visionary, but she needs someone in supply chain, someone in finance, and someone in commercial before I put money in. And that way, when you put that cocktail together, it's going to taste amazing. If you do it right now, you're going to get nothing but bourbon burn. And, and he's, he laughed and he, and he said, and I said, it's really a lot of times with businesses, sometimes the entrepreneur doesn't realize what they need to bring in beyond money to give them kind of the foundation for success. This person was a great thinker and visionary, but in terms of the nuts and bolts of the business, she'd never had that experience and she could go learn it, but it would just mean as an investor, you're going to lose a lot of money while she's learning it. Whereas if you can bring, get the support, you'll skip a lot of steps and steps and save a lot of money that you waste that um, typically happens when they do it the first time around. I agree with everything that Scott said. Okay, so I think uh, that does that does that uh, what, what was Walt, Walter? Did that answer your question, bro? I don't know if that's me or Walter. Walter. I think I think it's Walter because I could I could, I could see myself moving over here a little bit. Chantel. Oh. If, yeah, the parable did answer my question. All right. Th thank you, Walter. We appreciate you investing your time tonight. Thank you. All right, man. And, and so we don't all uh we, we don't we don't all witness uh witness Craig do uh do the rain dance in front of us all. <laughs> We're gonna make sure that we uh we bring the session to the end. But first, I, I wanna thank you, I wanna thank you both for making the time and space for us tonight. Um for me, it was even important. It, you know, the, I appreciate everything the series has been because, uh, you know, j just the investment to help us all to get better as a community and, and even to come and, and be a community together and 
learn together. Like it's been, it's been an incredible ride and I'm, I'm appreciative of, of all your time and, and all the thought processes, not just, not just Scott, not just Scott and uh, Craig, but Rigo and JB and Brandis and Mark and Chantel and everybody who, who, who you don't see on the, on the screen every session. Um, a lot goes into these sessions uh, for free grant, free game and a lot goes into our entire community platform. And on some days like, yo, today felt heavy and it, it feels heavy for a lot of reasons. But when you, when you step into these meetings in a conversation, it just, it just helps. It, it, it helps push me forward. So I hope, I hope uh, all of you are getting as much out of it as I am. Um, if we could, James, if we could have everybody lower their hand and we can get uh, a last picture to kind of close out our free game, if that's okay. If y'all could turn y'all's cameras on, we'll help you do that. But we're just gonna quick, a few quick slides. And um, again, echoing James and saying, thank you. We're gonna get some pictures. We're gonna do it really, really quickly. So just turn your screen on team, help me grab pictures. And then after this, we'll say good night. Hey, Chantel, it's Rigo. Can I jump in real quick before we get off? Yes, Go sir. For it. Go for it, please, Rigo. Because, because, because we owe you all, you, James, Mark, the Whitaker Group team, Whitaker Group team, a thank you as well. We appreciate your partnership uh, in the many endeavors that we, uh, we challenge you to embrace. And uh, we really, really appreciate um, the opportunity to get this thing started um we believe there's an opportunity to go beyond six but we'll you know we'll discuss that after after all but again just a huge thank you to you and your team as well uh we just doing our part we blessed to have the opportunity to do it like, like i said this is a journey we've been on for some time it's just really good to see it uh see it continue to evolve and continue to grow and it and it, and it forward to mean so much to so many people for us to have a space that we can come and learn together and once again i'll speak for myself I'm learning, I'm learning as well. And hey, I'm even going to therapy some sessions myself. So Rigo, uh, the, the appreciation is mutual. Uh, Chantel, I hope you got the, the, did you get, did you get the pretty picture of us all? Got everything we needed. Y'all look good. Listen again, Craig, Scott, Craig, Craig, uh, Craig, what, what, did, did Craig run? I noticed he got real quiet over there. <laughs> he uh, you just don't know. I'm I'm waiting for your uh you know salutations so I can get up out of here, man. Everybody, let's let Craig go. Peace, everybody. Scott, Peace. thank you, bro. We thank appreciate you. Thank you very much. I appreciate Good it. Love being part of it. Thank God you guys. Bless. Happy Thanksgiving. Night, everybody. Thank you. All right. Peace.